Say something else. Say something. Yeah. Say something really interesting. Um, I'm at the Dallas airport. Yeah, that's not it's interesting. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. It's uh, it's Todd Cochran in the Pre-Accident Podcast. How are you doing? Uh, Good, I hope. This is an interesting podcast. We, you know, it's uh, this is they're all a great experiment in communication. That's uh, all this damn thing is anyway. You know, you knew that going into this thing. This is the one. I don't want to call it, but it's going to be something like Bob Edwards calls in from the airport because uh, I really wanted to talk to Bob, and we really couldn't find a place to do it because. uh, He's busy out there, you know, teaching people how to talk to their workers, which is quite a gig, actually, when you think about it. Anyway, so he calls in from the airport, and the connection's crap, but uh, I guess we have to ask this question. Is it crappy enough? Is it too crappy for the podcast? I don't know. I equalized it and did some magic uh, audio, you know, within my limited ability to do magic audio voodoo. But I did some magic audio, audio voodoo to make it happen, and I think it's a, pre- it's a pretty good little podcast. It's definitely a, um, one to talk about, and there's always so much um, excitement to get Bob on the podcast because he's a breath of fresh air, and uh, you know, you need people. So uh, sometimes I think our world is filled with people who are uh, less than optimistic. Now they would tell me they're realists, and realists are fine. But um, I don't know. You kind of get into the old glass half, half empty, glass half broken thing. Um, or, or maybe I should say it this way. Glass half empty, glass half full, glass half broken. Because I always look at it this way. There are people who are optimists. Glass is half full. There are people who are pessimists. Uh, glass is half uh, empty. There are people who are super pessimists. The glass is half broken. And then there are engineers. The glass isn't appropriate for the amount of fluid you're carrying. All right, and, and all that kind of works together collectively to um, do a very quick armchair understanding of human personalities and behavior. So that's exciting. I mean, that's um, that's an interesting part of uh, how everything plays out for us, and that's good as well. How's your year going so far? So you know, this is my year to find humanity in um, in all people, and it's been a you know, it's been a good one. I mean, I actually think this is a pretty this is a pretty good New Year's resolution. It's been really helped. So it's no secret if you've known me a while, and God forbid if you've traveled with me, I am not the um, happiest person to go through airport security because I think airport security is stupid. We can talk about this a lot. Uh, maybe not in this podcast. I, I'm just setting the tone for it. But uh, I often am. Um, what's the word? A jerk, um, butthead would be another word that would work perfectly. Um, creep, that's another word. Um, when I go through airport security, just because, I, so two reasons. One is I, I have real problems with authority, um, but you know I'm in therapy for that, so stay with me. And two is it's it's kind of keeping them honest that 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 giving freely of your um, Liberty should be something you shouldn't do, and so it should. There should be a purpose for giving up freedom. That, that's what I think. I mean, we talk about all this. I don't want to get super p- political, but nonetheless, I'm less than patient with the TSA people traditionally, and we've had giant arguments. Like one time, I had one scream at me that this isn't Burger King. You don't get it your way, which I think he thought was really cute, but kind of didn't. Um, it didn't have the impact that he thought it would. That's for sure. And one time I had a one tell me that this isn't Walmart. And uh, so one time this guy told me that he's saving my life. Uh, and there's just been a lot of encounters with them. Lots and lots of One time they pulled my pants down and I told them they couldn't do that. And well, it's, it's, so, see, the thing is, is when you, if you have my body shape and you ask someone to take off their belt and then hold their arms up, if you do that to someone with my body shape, you don't really need to have the radar detector magnetometer. Because if I'm going to take off my belt, which is actually my belt does quite a bit of work, uh, and if I'm taking my belt off and holding my arms up, my pants are going down, right? So what's been weird about this government shutdown that's been going on for 
uh, it seems like a really, really long time, is that it's completely changed the way I think about the TSA. And remember, my, my New Year's resolution is to see humanity and good in all people. And I kind of wonder if that's uh, the universe making me do my New Year's resolution to probably the group that I needed to do it most to. And in fact, I've now started asking them if I could tip them. Um, and they all say the same thing. Oh, no, sir, we're not allowed to t- uh, accept tips. And then I say, well, what if I accidentally just dropped a $20 bill as I walked by? And they say, well, it, uh, we'd have to do quite a bit of reporting on that. <laughs> Please don't do that. But what's funny is it's really changed It's changed my relationship with them because in a way my heart's kind of breaking for these guys. And so that's um, that's that's been an interesting uh, – I don't know how to – that's been an interesting positive – potential behavioral outcome from all the crap that's going on in the world is that it's, it's really caused me to refocus that part of my life. And I must admit it's more pleasant and probably better. I, I probably went way farther in that story than I should. I got a little rambly there. Um, but um, nonetheless, suffice it to say that looking for the good in people is not a bad way to spend time. It really isn't. I mean, what's most crazy about this idea of looking for the good in people is that I have yet to not find it. Now, I'm pretty sure there are people out there that don't have good in them, but I guess I haven't encountered them yet. So busy is uh, probably the word we all could use, um, but I'm pretty convinced that telling you I'm busy is not very valuable anymore, so I'm going to stop doing that. What I'm going to tell you now is that I am at a point now where I'm pretty excited by all the stuff that's going on and by the amount of energy um, that's existing in the world um, around this whole idea of looking at at safety differently, looking at reliability differently, uh, really f- framing the way we look at workers differently. That has been super rewarding and super fun. And that's kind of reflected in the conversation you're going to hear with Bob and I. So I should probably shut up and kind of let this happen. Gut through it. It's not hard to hear. It's just, he's um, the fidelity on his phone because Bob um, uh, chooses his phone by one criteria free. If it's free, then that's the phone Bob has. So I can't get him to move up into the uh, higher dollar phones, but I will tell you, he spends less on phones than I do. So is, is that fair? So without any further ado, and first of all, thanks for listening. I'm so glad you're here. Um, gosh, it, there's so many great podcasts coming up. You'll just want to hold on for sure. But uh, until then, this is Bob Edwards and a uh, an interesting little discussion about learning really across geographical borders and in the world and what's going on with Bob and what he's thinking. So here is Bob Edwards on the pre-accident podcast. Oh yeah. So what I'm excited about this year is how this crazy learning team thing that we do so much of are a really gaining a lot of traction in a lot of different places. Like not, not just one or two. I mean, it's like really has become a great way to introduce organizations to a new way of thinking and a new way of, I mean, not a totally new way, but maybe just a, a little bit healthier, more holistic way. I feel a little bit presumptuous when I say a new way, like, I, like I'm helping do something new, but it is, it is, it seems like it is really helping to shift sort of a cultural um, approach, if you will, towards work and towards the worker and towards even management, right? Because I love what Humberdahl says about it. Damon Humberdahl says, yeah, we, need, we need those managers because they have to, sort of provide a space for all this to happen. And, uh, of course, we need the workers because they're the ones that know the work. And, anyway, it's a nice – I like it. I like what's happening. And I like the fact that, that it seems to be working in, like, a bunch of different cultures and countries and things like that. Too. So it's not just, uh, you know, good for the southeast of the United States or just good for California or whatever. It seems to be having an impact in, um, in very different cultures. So where are, where all are you doing it? Um, so Tennessee and California, pretty much. Is it? <laughs> That's like two different countries, right? Yeah, no. Well, it depends if you That's live it. there or not. Right. No, it's that. So the, the places that I've been able to, to introduce the learning team, uh, you know, places of course like we've, we've done this a bunch in Australia, um, Mexico, and Canada, in uh, in several. Uh, countries in Asia, you know, we've had China, 
Singapore, Bangkok, headed to Bangladesh soon, and really, and then some of our some of our champions of this, like they're having like really good success in South America. And so it's kind of exciting to see this this simple concept of bringing people together in a in a no blame environment to say, hey, let's let's really try to understand work, and, and you guys help you guys that do the work help us make this work better. Um, it's almost I don't want to say it's a universal truth, but it seems to be universally accepted so far. It's the places I've been. What's Does this, that make sense? Yeah, totally. What's the secret to doing these interculturally? What's or, or do you do you find they're much different interculturally? Like, what's is it difficult to do it in a different language? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm just gonna say the key is good translation, because um, you know. But what was interesting is like when we were doing these in Bangkok, um, the the gentleman there who had gone through the training and really kind of co-led with me, I would say he kind of led it and I kind of went along for the ride because it was so much easier for him to have this conversation and then they would just kind of, you know, keep me clued in on what was going on. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. But he spoke it in the local, you know, spoke in the local dialect that what was interesting is on his learning team, there was even some people that, didn't understand him, so they had a translator translating it into another language. That was it was just remarkable. So here I am, the English speaker, and then two different languages other than that also involved. And yet the, the learning team that we really did capture in just a couple of sessions captured a great understanding of this work and some clever ideas on how to make it safer and more reliable and better. That work's going to break the bank. And so once again, that's learning team, right? That's uh, it's that. That bringing people together so they can look at the work, see what looks normal, see what's messy about it, see what could be made better, and then doing something about it. And then what was really impressive to me, Todd, is that like a couple of weeks later, I heard that that group over there had already done like eight learning teams. And it wasn't forced. They didn't have like a metric to do eight in three weeks or whatever. It was just, it made sense to them. They had other events and other issues they wanted to talk about. And this the process is so simple, they just went and did it. So that's, that's encouraging to me. You know, it doesn't take a, a, a long time to catch on how to do this, which is great. What do you see the future? I mean, what what do you think? What do you think the future holds for us? So what what I'm seeing happening already is is that once once organizations get comfortable with the you know, we talk about the black line, blue line, right? The, the blue line's the reality. Once they get way more comfortable with the blue line reality and that, that people make mistakes, blaming them for it doesn't fix anything, we've got to get better at learning. Once you get more comfortable with this sort of open, messy, if you will, conversation, um, then we start applying it to all kind of stuff. You know, uh, I was just at a site this week and they said, hey, this, could, this sort of thinking could work with like a free job and post job conversation, didn't it? And of course we know the answer is yes. Mark Gesson, you know, Mark Gesson can tell us that, right? Yeah. If we if we get good at sort of post job or post event learning right there on the spot, right after the work has been completed, wow, we just built a little learning and improvement cycle right there in our everyday um in our everyday work cycle. And maybe maybe not get rid of but maybe minimize some of these long punch lists or checklists for the pre job or the post job and have more of that open conversation. Like you're always talking about, you know, hey, what went well? And this is cool because they came up with this and they had not read what we've done. They just were learning this and they said, well, wouldn't it make more sense that like at, at the end of the job, we just kind of talk through, hey, what was the way we thought it would and what didn't? And, uh, you know, what, what sort of stuff do we need to work on? It was the same sort of things that, that you know, we've been talking about. Um, anyway, it's kind of exciting to see them start to apply this to other parts of their work just naturally. What do you think your secret and sauce, I, I, what's your secret sauce? What is uh, it that makes you successful at this? Oh, that makes me successful? Well, I, you know, I step in a holiday in express. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's it. And there, I thought you knew that. No, but and, I do now. Know? That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's totally the secret, you right? um, know. No, I think, the, I think the secret to this, if there is a secret, there's so much of a secret, but it really is, is getting comfortable with, with sort of respecting people uh, all through the organization, no matter what level their education is, everybody's an expert at something. 
respecting them, knowing that the people that do the work really do know the work. They do know it better than the person that planned the work because they physically have done it. And I think that's the, that the secret sauce right there is, is, is kind of respect and trust. And it may sound a little soft and fuzzy around the edges, but it really is what makes this happen. If, if I can build an environment where people are comfortable, they, they trust me that we're, we're not going after anybody, we really do want to learn and improve, then they'll talk about it. They'll talk about their work. They'll talk about the problems. They'll talk about what they messed up. And what I love about this shifting accountability for me and my thinking anyway, and, in, and really in an action is, is okay, maybe, maybe you even did mess it up, Todd. That, you didn't mean to, but sort of the accountability piece is that you, you're close to it. You help me make it better. So it's not like a get out of jail free card. It's, no, I need you. you yeah, you messed up. Okay, fine. But, but let's fix it. Let's make it better. And I need you to make it better. And I actually heard my plant manager say that one time. Uh, back when I still worked at um, you know, my, my previous company. And even though he's the plant manager, he, he would talk about the fact that he couldn't fix these problems without the help of the people that really truly know the work. And so I don't know, it's a big part of it is just that respect across the organization. But I think it also shows respect back towards the leadership. And I think it's important that you know, people that do the work appreciate their leadership for making a space for this learning and making a space for this improvement process. So it's kind of it's definitely we kind of need in, in, in. It's definitely clear to me yeah. that the learning teams are getting a life of their own. What can we do to support yeah, yeah. what can we do to support sort of the uh continued diffusion and success of learning teams for everybody who's doing this human performance stuff? Um, I mean I I think the more we can build it into the way we do stuff. You know, I love how Gwen can cave did it at her site. She just pretty soon, it was just kind of what they did. I don't know that they even told the warning teams anymore. Something would happen, it pulled together. You've talked about it, you've seen it, you've been at the site, right? The get flip charts, start learning, digging in, understanding the complexity of the failure, and, and then working on solutions. It just became what they did. So the more we, it's like anything, right? It's like muscle memory for throwing a baseball. The more we do them, and then the more we share both the things that worked well and things that didn't, we're, we just continue to get better at it and more comfortable at it. Like, like if you said to me, well, like right now, something just happened out there in the factory, I need you to go out, give me a five whys and a root cause. Like, I mean, it doesn't really even make sense anymore because we've done these so much. It's like, well, I mean, I may not have to do a full blown learning team, but I, I want to go out and understand context. Like, automatically, my brain thinks this probably wasn't one thing, this was a bunch of things. Well, that's not how I was eight years ago, Dr. Conklin, if you remember our argument in the hall, right? Yes. Um, I, was sure, I was sure there was a root cause, and I was sure there was that punishment would straighten this out. And so tell me again, what do you think, I mean, what do you think we can do to continue the success of learning teams? Because I think that's the most important message. Uh, yeah, I think, I think just really keep, keep doing them. Look for reasons to do them. Don't, like, don't put metrics on them like they have to do so many of them. I, I'm way more important. I think it's way more important to do good quality learning teams, but do them and then share those stories. You know, share what, what was good, what was bad, what was easy, what was hard. Share those stories. Build confidence that we can keep doing this sort of, uh, use this sort of methodology because it really seems to be, you know, the more we practice it, the more comfortable we get with it. So, and then somebody from the quality department says, hey, you've been doing those learning teams on safety events or whatever. How, how, about, how about something that just happened in quality? I mean, the answer is yes, we'll do one there. Or maybe we'll uh, take a look at our, our, some policy we've written or some what, whatever. I mean, we can just really use this collaborative method, keep it simple, let the story be messy, and then let the people that are close to it help you solve it. And um, and I think just the more we do it, the more we sort of see how it fits and, and where it will go. Practice, right? Does it make you feel guilty to know that for a living you go out and tell companies to talk to their workers? Well, it would, except that I have to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to fly, so I don't feel real guilty. <laughs> so, no, no, it's great because what happens, you know what's happening, with this, which is cool too, is part of what we're doing too is connecting sometimes very different industries to help them 
like kind of learn from each other. And so that's important too, is that building that network of learning is beyond your own walls. And so when you have a learning team that's working on some problem and it's in a completely different industry that you know of a similar type process. Hey, what's going on might, there? You got a party going on? Yeah. Well, the party's starting, but I, you know, I told him, hold up. I'll be there in a minute. It's a, it's a, it's a paparazzi. You know, they just <laughs> realized I'm here. They're, they're chasing me down. Uh, now I have somebody downstairs here. I don't know what's going on. So, yeah, so even connecting different, completely different industries to learn from each other, that's, you know, that seems to be pretty, uh, pretty helpful as well. And getting people to talk, even if it's crazy, I know, but once again, it seems like we wouldn't have to say this to anybody, but sometimes even within organizations, we're not even really talking much between departments. We're kind of like have all these silos still, and so it helps break some of those down. And there may be a need for some of those sort of silos. I don't know. I don't want to be judgy about it. I just know that it helps sometimes when, when I may be really comfortable around the safety conversation to go over and talk with someone in the quality and be curious and question things that they're working on. And I don't know. And then they come over and question the way I'm doing stuff. I don't know. It seems like it helps to be open to learning from other people and other, even other organizations. And I think that's a part of this operational learning. We, we realize we don't know and we want to learn. And so if you want to learn, go to people that maybe know better than you. Well, and one of the huge advantages I think is, is the engagement. I mean, it really does change the engagement in a company. It does. I mean, people will ask you, when do I get to be on a learning team? I've said this before on one of our podcasts, I'm sure, but I have never, since I've been in the industry since 89, never once had somebody said, when are you going to come investigate me? Right? <laughs> I mean, never, right? Well, I'm sure we should come investigate me and my team, but, but we, I, we, I mean, we have people saying, you know, we're, we've got more requests for learning teams than we've got coaches to go lead them. And that's a, that's a good problem to have. It's people wanting to be involved, asking to be involved, saying, you know, how come, how come I can't be involved in this? They see how much the work teams are valued and they want to be involved. People want to make things better. I really believe that. They don't, I think sometimes they've given up. And so I had somebody say the other day, hope kind of comes from up, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's like you're bringing a little hope back into the workplace that we can make it better. We don't have to just be stuck with all the stuff that we've been doing forever so so last yeah, question so. why don't you write a book about this you know i've thought about that but i don't know i think there's just there's too many books on hop already so i think uh now i so i'm you know i you know i've been working on this and i've got the nine chapters i've got the introduction and nine chapters written and now i've got starting to have people look at them to help me get the wording correct and get the spelling errors out. And so, you know, it'd be, I, I think, I think, I think as I'm writing and finishing this book up, I think it'd also be a good idea if you would take a little time to write a book on the five principles because, you know, they've kind of changed and shift a the bit. So I think it'd be good to help people understand where they came from and where they're headed and, um, and why it's important to understand that. So this is an idea for you to think about. I don't know if you thought about that or not. Okay, I think we should make it a, a bet. The first one done gets a hundred dollars from the other person. All right, good. And a case of Diet Dr. Pepper for you and a case of uh, Arnold Palmer tea for me. Arnold Palmer tea. Okay, it's fair enough. Yeah, All right, that's fair. All right, good deal. Bet, the bet is on. All right, my brother. Well, thanks for spending time with us today. Yes, my pleasure. Look forward to seeing you. And maybe, hey, we may run into each other in the airport sometime, eh? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yes, maybe we will. Uh, enjoy, my friend. Bon appetit. Enjoy the flight. Where do you go from Dallas to, to uh, Dallas Charlotte? Dallas to Chattanooga. No, no. Dallas to Chattanooga. Then you're home. Nice. Home for the weekend. Nice, brother. Well, have a good trip. Have a good weekend. Thanks. You too. Bye. Later. Bye. So there you go. That's Bob. Huh? It, wasn't, it got better, didn't it? It, his, it did get better because his phone dropped or my phone dropped uh, four different times. I wonder if you could kind of tell where they were in there. But the, towards the end, the fidelity of the conversation did get better. I think because he was standing in the basically in a stairwell <laughs> in the airport at Dallas-Fort Worth, which is the airport where I saw Lyle Love at once. So I, I, there will always be a warm spot in my heart 
for the airport at Dallas, for Dallas Fort Worth. But um, that is the Bob Edwards podcast, as amazing as it sounds. And that's our time together um, for today. Gosh, what else? Uh, so much. There is so much to tell you. But mostly what I want to tell you is thanks for being a part of this podcast. Tell your friends. Uh, have some people subscribe. That seems to make a huge difference. But mostly if you're thinking about um, – some ideas, and you want to be on the podcast this year, and you think you've got something to say, I uh, I got some people that want to listen to you, especially if you're clever. If you're really clever, then I'm into it for sure. Until then, my friends, um, have as much fun as you possibly can. Learn something new every single day. And for goodness sakes, you guys, be safe. <laughs>